Hello, everybody. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm dean of the Clinton School, and uh, welcome uh, today. Thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, uh, welcome our guest, someone I've been trying to get here for years, and he can confirm that. Uh, but I'm honored that he's here and to, and to engage in this uh, conversation. Leslie Dock's the Executive Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Walmart. He has everything under his uh, category from corporate communications, philanthropy, government relations, public policy. I met Leslie years ago when, when, when we were both a little younger than we are now. But um, he worked with Edelman, a, a global communications group and that brought him into contact uh, with Walmart, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, and, but prior to that, he, he, he's been very active in Democratic Party politics. He worked in the Clinton administration. Uh, he is recognized as one of the uh, uh, experts in this field. He knows it well. Very strong connections with the Environmental Defense Fund, the National Audubon Society, and other environmental-related groups. And you need to know, that if you don't already, that, that he's recently announced that he'll be leaving Walmart, uh, returning to Washington in June, uh, no doubt to do something really interesting, which will be exciting, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad about that. So please join me in welcoming Leslie Dock to the Clinton School. Thank you. So what is corporate and social responsibility. First, let me just say it's great to be here and thanks, Skip, for, for all that, you know, for getting me here. It's uh, obviously a big admirer of President Clinton and a big admirer of the kind of education that Skip and the school have put together here because I think it's so important for folks to uh, enter public service, no matter how that's defined, uh, and to do it with uh, uh, skills and experience and dedication. So I just think it's, I think it's great. Um, and I guess I get a chance to go back and had a little chance to visit with some of the students and as I go other places, I'm amazed at how much better, not amazed, but they are so much better prepared and so much better educated and so much able to make a difference than I was when I went to school. It's a remarkable thing, so that's great. The, uh, you know, I think there is, corporate social responsibility I believe has changed and I'll try and think about it as I think about it kind of as at Walmart. You know, I think for a long time that people saw corporate social responsibility primarily as philanthropy, uh, that it was a business's obligation to kind of give money back. And while I think that's really important, I think that that's really not what it's about. And I, I we, you know, the Walmart Foundation last year, in terms of Walmart giving, we'll have passed a billion dollars in giving. So it's not an insubstantial sum around the world. And at the same time, I think it is really only a small portion of what we can do. So I think what social responsibility really is, is how you can take the business model and apply it to large social issues to make change. Uh, and so for Walmart, I think for us, that meant a re recognition that there are large issues that our customers and our communities care about that we can make a big difference on just by doing our business every day. And so we try to think about what that was, and I think it really comes down to a handful of things for us, and for every company it's different. But for us, it's first our supply chain. We have a tremendous ability to make a difference in the way goods are manufactured uh, around the world, from sustainability to women-owned businesses to uh, how workers are treated around the world. So how do we use our supply chain to make a difference? That's a big part of our strength. The other is to remember who we are and what we do for a living. And one of the reasons why I love working at Walmart is because we go to work every day and we think of people who are either the emerging middle class around the world or people who live in America who are right at the brunt of this economic uh, uh, difficulty that we're in. And so we know that the folks uh, who shop at our store don't have the same economic choices that others might. So if we think of something like uh, healthier foods, we know that even in our own polling that a majority of our shoppers say that they want to eat healthy, but they don't think they can afford to. So it's our job to give them, make our food healthier, but also make our healthy food more affordable. So because we don't believe that somebody who shops at Walmart should have to choose between a product that's good for them and a product they can afford. They shouldn't have to choose between a product that's healthy for them and a family and their families and a product they can afford. If they want to 
buy something that's good for the planet, they shouldn't have to pay more for it because they just simply can. It's unfair to ask them, and by asking them, you won't get the result that you want. So we've tried to take both of those things and say, how do we as a business make, it, make a difference? And that's what's led us to issues like sustainability and, and uh, women's economic empowerment and healthier food and sustainable agriculture. And when my friends who were at other businesses ask me what they should do to be better liked, I always tell them to go be a better business. Um, and I think that's something else that Walmart was willing to do. It had issues, and, we went, and it went ahead and said, um, you know, we're going to try and be a better business. When I did all, a lot of corporate communications, companies would come and say, we want to be better liked, but when you asked them to be a better business, they, would, they, didn't, want, they didn't want to do it. They just wanted to be better liked. We were misunderstood. We need better communications. I, I, I don't think that's really the issue in most places. I'm a communications professional, some people think, but, the, but I think it's really about being a better business, because and that's how you then tell the tell this story. So that's what I think social responsibility is about, being a better business, using, this, using your business to make a difference on the big issues. One of our students who is here and who you had lunch with, Gina Lopez, uh, who is getting her concurrent degree at the Walton MBA School in Fayetteville, is, is working on women's empowerment issues uh, with Walmart, taking uh, uh, women uh, entrepreneurs, and many of them in, in, uh, in third world countries, getting them access on the Walmart website. Walmart's really taken a major role in, 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 in the promotion of, of women entrepreneurship and businesses. Can you talk about that and talk about what, what, what what encouraged that strategy and where you see that going? I'd love to. One of the great things about my job is I get to sit there and, and think of where the sweet spot of Walmart is and where the sweet spot of making a difference is. And that's been the great part about it. And uh, uh, being a big company with, uh, you know, there are a lot of sweet spots. Um, and the company's also been willing to say to itself, and I've been a little bit of a help on this, to say, what we're going to do is we're going to identify, we're going to come up with these really large goals, you know, five years down the road that are big enough that even the people who are really cynical about what we do just have to grudgingly admit, man, that's really impressive. Uh, because that's the only real test. And I'm in a business with a lot of metrics. We measure everything. But I have a qualitative view of what leadership is. And that's that people who don't really like you have to basically look at you and say, wow, that's really some good stuff. Uh, even if they wake up in the morning kind of wanting not to like you. Um, and it doesn't take that much insight to realize how important women are to a, to a retail business. So 75% of our customers are women. They control 75% of the purchases or more running through a Walmart store. Um, and so to really have products that represent what women want to buy, you want to have women suppliers. One th other thing I've learned in business is that the most precious commodity is human talent. We're a global business. We're getting close to $500 billion uh, in revenue. The biggest single impediment to us being successful as we expand is not our ability to invest in something, it's our ability to have the best people to run those businesses and work in them. And so if you're in a global war, war for talent, you cannot leave 51% of the population aside. You have to really find and cultivate um, those leaders and make the place where you work a place that's attractive uh, to them and where they want to succeed and where they can bring those skills. You also have to have usually inclusive and diverse leadership around the table. We operate in very complex situations, and it is impossible for any single person to make the right decision. The only way you make the right decisions is if you're surrounded around a table like that with people who represent different points of view, different experiences, and different responsibilities. If we let the lawyers decide what the risk was, we wouldn't be doing very much. If you let me decide where the risk was, we'd be taking too much. But between us, we come up with a reasonable approach. So all of those reasons argue uh, uh, that, if, that if we have a deeper relationship with women as customers, with women as suppliers, with women as associates, we're going to be a better business. And so then we applied what we said before. We said, okay, what, you know, what's our sweet spot? Well, the first is we buy and sell stuff. So we said, okay, we're going to go and we're going to make a five-year pledge to buy $20 billion worth of uh, uh, goods from women-owned businesses in the United States. It's a large number. And then we said to ourselves, overseas, uh, we're going to double the amount. Uh, of women-owned businesses uh, that we buy from. We couldn't actually come up with a number because there is no definition of a women-owned business in a lot of countries and there's no baseline. So you, you could, you, first thing we have to do is figure out how much we currently buy today, then we can go somewhere. But we also did, I think, 
a, a number of other important things. We committed to uh, train a million women around the world, 500,000 in agriculture, in their first job. Uh, because we want, we know, as everybody else does, from Secretary Clinton to anybody who's worked in this area, that uh, you know, if you invest in women back in the in the developing world or here in America, you make for a healthier family, you make for a healthier economy. They return more to the community, they return more to their families. It it, it is a huge investment in public health and a huge investment in economic development. It's the best dollar you can spend. So we want to help train women for their first job, whether that means. Uh, uh, here in the U.S. through philanthropic work or whether a lot of the work that we do training people overseas. We also said that we wanted to go in and provide training to women who work for us in the factory floor so they can have greater strength and, and learn some basic economic and financial family skills, but also be able to kind of talk back more and demand more from uh, the factories in which they work. And we also said that we were going to diversify, work to diversify all of the professional services, the big professional services firms that we work with, and all the billion dollar suppliers we have around the world. A guy named Tom Mars, who uh, was in our legal department, member, and, and from Arkansas, a member of the Rose Law Firm at some time, a friend of the Skips, he really led us in this direction with our law firm. So now we're in the process of going out uh, to all of our major professional service providers and all of the big suppliers that have teams in Bentonville and saying, we want to know. Uh, uh, about the women and the uh, other um, diverse membership that you have on the teams that support us. And we're going to take the lack thereof or the presence thereof into account as we decide you know, what our relationship is going to be with you going forward. And we expect to see more diversity across the table in the future than we have today. And we said we would su support all this with $100 million in philanthropic giving over five years. And uh, it, it's been a great thing to do. It's brought great suppliers in. You can imagine what it's like in making Walmart a more attractive place to work for women. Uh, just like the work we do in sustainability makes us a more attractive place to work. So if you can, if you can, um, you know, buy, uh, be a buyer at Walmart, and you're a woman, but you also get to make a difference in in, in helping women-owned businesses around the world. What a great job that is! Uh, so it makes the jobs a lot more interesting. Makes people prouder to work at Walmart. Gives us products we don't have. Uh, one example. Uh, we have a, w a woman who supplies us uh, with lingerie. And um, her father's a rabbi. She's from New York. And so for about 20 years, she could never tell her father. She would just say, I'm in, I'm in women's clothing. <laughs> but her vision was that you know, a woman who is, you know, is a Walmart shopper should feel as good about their lingerie as somebody who can afford more expensive stuff. And so she has spent her whole life putting together a, uh, a, a bra and underwear uh, department for us where you can get the best possible stuff for less than $10. Because she believes you know, that, that a, a, a woman who can only afford six, seven, eight dollars for a bra should feel as good about what they're putting on as anybody else. No guy would have come up with that. Uh, and even people like me who think they're quasi-enlightened find it, you know, it's not the most comfortable thing to talk about in front of a large group. But you know I wouldn't be in that business. So it's just one example even of how, you know, your, your ability to serve your customers improved. Leslie, I'm on the board of uh, Arkansas Children's Hospital, um, in which, by the way, Walmart has been a big supporter of that hospital. But every day when children leave after treatment at the facility, We've determined that about 25% of those children go home to a home where there is inadequate food. That hunger is a huge issue. Fed well in the hospital, but home hungry again. We've worked with the Arkansas Hunger Relief Alliance. We've done a lot of work our school has over the years in trying to help do what we can to elevate this issue. You all have made a huge investment. Uh, and, and, and maybe one of the most remarkable things under your tenure uh, here is this commitment to, uh, to focus on hunger. Can you talk about that and, 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 and tell me why and what you sort of see this thing progressing uh, down the road? Yeah, it's a critical issue made even more critical uh, you know, by the economy and, and what that's meant for, for families around the country. It's also, I think, a really good example of the, your kind of the when you ask me what does social responsibility mean for Walmart. So we're the world's largest grocer and America's largest grocer. It didn't take a genius to figure out 
that one of the things we should be doing is making a bigger contribution with our food. And of course, what's interesting is that we weren't really doing that. Now, one other great thing about Walmart is I always say to folks like, I could have come up with the same idea together with the team, and I could have worked for a little grocer, and we would have given away food, but it would have only been a little food. Uh, but one of the great things about the joy of working at Walmart is we woke up and said, you know, we're going to make a major contribution uh, in helping make a difference in hunger in America. And we made a $2 billion commitment to ending hunger in the U.S. And last year, we became the first company ever to give away a billion meals to Feeding America. So we're, last year, we gave away over 300 million meals, but now we've reached a total of a billion meals, the only company that's, that's ever done that. And, it's, and it requires work to give away that food. Uh, first of all, people have a misconception that we only give away food that, you know, you can't sell. Well, the fact is, that's not true. We work very hard to give away food before the expiration date. We work very hard to give away food that's high in protein. So we've had to do things like uh, put a cooler or a freezer in every store so we can take the food that we want to give it away and store it before we, uh, we give it away. We've had to train people to take that food off the floor and put it away. Uh, so we've, we pledged to give $1.75 billion away in food and support it with $250 million in philanthropy. And the philanthropy has gone towards improving the food infrastructure in America. So, we give, so one of the things we've done is to help create cold supply chains in the uh, food pantry system so that you can give away food and dairy and high protein and have it uh, be transported uh, back to the food bank and given away. Uh, we're, we're supporting school breakfast and lunch programs, far, far too many uh, students, particularly here in the state of Arkansas, including in Northwest Arkansas, are on one or two meals a day. They rely on their schools uh, to feed them, and we have to make a difference there. Um, and the other um, part is that there are, it ties so deeply in with health and nutrition. So we've also made a commitment with Michelle Obama to reformulate our food supply and make the healthier food that we sell more affordable to build stores in food deserts. But we're also working on helping to teach people how to shop healthy and how to cook healthy. And that's another big part of this, because very few of fam you know, a lot of families don't have the skills to do that. So it, it's one of these issues that takes a complete circle approach um, to make a difference. Um, but it's something where you can make a difference. Is this going to be a long-term commitment? I mean, do you see this multi-year, I mean, down the road? I mean, I think it's a forever commitment, because the problem is going to be with us. And, you know, for good or for bad, we have the opportunity to give away this food every year. And strangely enough, you know, or interestingly enough, one of the reasons where we first came to this and where this all kind of funny fits together is we also have this emphasis on uh, zero waste. We said we were going to take 100 percent, you know, n not put any waste in a landfill from a Walmart store. Well, a lot of the waste we used to put uh, out of a Walmart store in a landfill was food. We used to pay people to throw away the food. So now, we save the money we used to pay to the disposal companies to take away the food, and we feed all these people. So it's when you open your eyes to some of these things, it really opens you up to do things. So we've saved money, uh, and we're giving away this food. It's a, it's a wonderful thing for us, but it's a problem you know, that's not going to go away. Leslie, one of our graduates who makes us very proud, uh, Julie Gerke, uh, is with the Walmart Foundation, works with you and others. Uh, and as you talked about Walmart's generous giving in terms of dollar amounts, how do you, how do you make the determination as your priorities of, of what, what are you going to do? Is, I mean, what, what ranks in the list? I know it, for many years, Walmart, for example, was a very generous uh, benefactor of programs in the Delta. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you determine what, what the priorities are and, and how's that set? It is a really tough question because a billion dollars in its cash and in kind is a lot of money, but it barely makes a dent in the issues, you know, that, 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 that we all care about every day, particularly when you spread it out over all the communities that we have an opportunity to serve. Um, so we have really tried to go back to that question of who we are as a business. So we have basically said that we should use our foundation dollars to support the same kind, the, the, the folks who shop in our stores, that the economic, uh, and social diversity of the people who shop in our stores. So you won't see us do a lot of things that other corporations do, which are great things, but you won't see us give very much to culture. You won't see us give a lot of money to the arts, because we're really trying to give a money, into, money into these core economic issues. And so we have, after a lot of work, really focused in, in, in two or three places. One is all this work on hunger and nutrition that I mentioned before because we think that's critical, we think we can make a difference. 
Another is in uh, opportunity, where we think we can help um, folks who enter the workforce with low skills, who might not have had the opportunity to have a great education, to find a job and to learn the skills to prosper. And that's all the way from things like Dress for Success uh, to working with community colleges so that you can really align uh, what people are taught in community colleges with the ability to get a job. Uh, so we're very heavily focused in that area. Uh, we have, uh, I'd say those are our two largest areas. And the third, women's economic empowerment, as I discussed before, both here and overseas. And then we have a minor in disaster relief and a minor in veterans and a minor in sustainability. Um, but it takes every ounce of smarts to stay focused and to really find the leverage and to really drive impact. Giving away money is really hard. Uh, giving away money wisely is doubly hard um, because um, you really need to make every dollar count. You're accountable to the IRS and to yourself about how that works. Um, and uh, uh, it is really hard work. You, you, you mentioned a minor in veterans. I, I, I kind of call it a major when you've made this major commitment to employ uh, veterans as they leave active duty. I, I, think, uh, I think that's a strong commitment. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can, you, uh, can you discuss that? Because that was, um, that was big to say, if you're a veteran, we're, we're going we're gonna to hire you. Yeah. It is a, it's a, it was an honor to be able to uh, do that as a company and to be part of that. Um, um, as you can imagine, given you know who Walmart is and the, and the state in which we serve and the, and the culture of the company, we have always been an active supporter of trying to help veterans and to hire them. And we are the largest uh, employer of veterans in the country. Sometimes we're the largest employer of Hispanics and African Americans, women and veterans. That's just the math. So you can take some credit for it, but it's actually a bit of just the math. Um, but, you know, we, Bill Simon, who's the CEO of the U.S. company, is a, a Navy veteran, so particularly felt strongly about this. Um, and so we were looking at a way that we could make a difference. And we were able to say um, just a few months ago that we would uh, provide a job to enter any honorably discharged U.S. veteran within 12 months of getting their discharge who wanted to work at Walmart. Um, and so that's a big pledge. And it was another, you know, what I loved about it, like some of the other things we've done, we had no idea, uh, uh, you know, whether we could actually, we were on the hook for a big thing. And we actually didn't have the systems in place to get it done. And we gave it a firm date of May, of Memorial Day to get started. Um, and so we've been meeting feverishly to make this thing work. Because right now, if you apply for a job at a Walmart, you don't apply centrally, you really apply store by store. So we have to now collect uh, you know, kind of the names nationally. We made a pledge also to provide the mentoring and support that these veterans need to succeed. We think 100,000 people will take, you know, will, will take us up on the deal. Um, but it is a great thing to be able to do. And we also um, uh, were able to then join with Michelle Obama and joining forces to make it even better. So when we we let the uh, administration know about what it is that we were going to do. They wondered how we could work together. And so we agreed on a, we basically said, why don't we go out and see if we can get other companies to really build on their existing commitments, but to make them bigger with more urgency. So we had a meeting at the White House uh, about two Mondays ago. We invited the 50 top employers in the US, and we got 43 to come. Now, I mentioned, you know, that's another nice thing about, you know, mentioned about our supply chain. So we went back into our supply chain. We got 43 of the 50 largest employers in the country to come to this meeting. And I hope that in the next month or two months, you'll see a lot of them stand back up with us and dramatically increases the pledges and the urgency of the pledges that they made. And now we're, you know, we're going back to the administration who's interested in these pledges, but to also say, you know what, DOD and the VA can do a better job than they have been doing and to support these veterans and to also uh, help us support veterans. So, you know, you're out, the government's spending a lot of money uh, supporting veterans when they come back. And this is a great example we were talking about at launch about the need for public-private partnerships. We can hire veterans. The government can, really can't. They're going to be letting a lot more veterans go than they hire. Uh, but the government can supply a lot of the support services that veterans need to succeed that we can't do. You know, it's really interesting to hear this because you, just in listening to you talk and talking about your working with the administration, I think back to candidate Obama and uh, and in the, in the tenuous relationship with Walmart, and now to President Obama and First Lady Obama in the close 
working relationship. My final question before um, to open it up is, your colleague and friend, Sylvia Matthews Burwell, has just been nominated uh, to head the Office of Management and Budget. Um, obviously, we both know her. Uh, clearly, we both like her. Um, but uh, would you comment? And I, I know what you're going to say. You think it's, a, as I would, it is an outstanding appointment. But um, talk about Sylvia and, and the role she can make uh, in government. Yeah, so Sylvia Matthews Burwell will make a great director of OMB uh, uh, when she's confirmed, which will hopefully be in a few weeks. But Sylvia should be an inspiration to every student here. So I first met Sylvia in the Dukakis campaign in, uh, in 1988. It wasn't a very successful campaign, although I like to remind people we did win the primaries. But uh, <laughs> not that that mattered at the time. And we had an, one thing about presidential campaigns, which I have encouraged, I encourage every person, you know, every kid to do, my son thankfully listened to me, uh, was that you get incredible talent and incredible passion and incredible values in one place. And that people who do that job tend to do it their whole lives. They come back in and out of public service in some way. So I, I think there's, you know, if you care about these issues and you're in your 20s or later, you know, but particularly there's no better place to be. And Sylvia was part of the economic team in 1988. Uh, interestingly, I'll just, because there are some other uh, folks who were engaged in the Clinton administration whose names you might know. So we give you a story about the Dukakis campaign, if I can, for sure. one second. There are many, but <clears throat> so our opposition research room was a room about twice the size of this uh, stage. It was, and we had in that one room uh, the following uh, four people doing opposition research. Uh, a woman named uh, Kay Cass Stevens, who's now with the National Gallery, but uh, sitting next to her was a guy named uh, Todd Stern, who was the staff secretary in the White House, but now is the chief U.S. climate negotiator at the State Department. A guy named John Podesta, whose name some folks may know, who turned out to be Clinton's chief of staff. And a, uh, another uh, woman whose name you might know, Elena Kagan, who's now a Supreme Court justice. So the four of them sat in a room about twice the size of this podium. And then right outside the room was a, another guy whose name you, heard, you may have heard of, named George Stephanopoulos, who was our writer. And then our intern was another guy you may have heard of, named Gene Sperling. And so we had a pretty nice little crew of people sitting in a space, like I said, not much bigger than this. The irony of the whole thing was that for whatever number of days we did this, every day they would, you know, George Bush would say something, they would research it, they would write something we would want Dukakis to say, they would do the research, they'd give it to George, he would write it, they would, you know, they would, they would give it to me, I'd send it to the airplane, and Dukakis never said it. <laughs> never, not, not once. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and Sylvia was part of that economic team, and then she went on, she, uh, Harvard, Rhodes Scholar, McKinsey, went into the administration, uh, came down here to Little Rock, uh, worked in the Clinton uh, campaign all that time, went into the White House as the chief of staff to Robert Rubin at the NEC, then went with him to be the chief of staff at the Treasury Department, uh, then was uh, at the ripe age of 27. Uh, she and John Podesta were the deputy chiefs of staff to Erskine Bowles when he was the White House chief of staff and then the deputy director of OMB. All of that probably by the ripe old age of 32 or something like that. Then went off and made a career uh, uh, helping to start and run the Gates Foundation then came to the Walmart Foundation. So an incredibly talented person who uh, has the most, you know, has the best values you could ever see. Grew up in Hinton, West Virginia, small town in West Virginia, and Hinton, West Virginia is with her every day of her job. So it's a great appointment because she's got all the experience and technical skills to do the job, but just a deep belief in trying to, you know, the, in, in making people's lives better. So she'll be great, and it's, she's an inspiration to, uh, you know, everybody who's in these hallowed halls about the kind of difference one person can make. Totally agree with that. Now. Let's, uh, let's ask, uh, let's open it up for questions. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, it's coming right at you. There you go. Mr. Doc, this has been a very interesting presentation. We see that you're leaving Little Rock before our notorious summer weather hits in June, but as you know, it won't be a lot better in Washington. Uh, I think most of us really appreciate the great strides that Walmart has made going forward on sustainability issues and improving the environment, a number of which you've touched on today. 
one area where some of us wonder if Walmart is considering improvement, it does directly relate to the supply chain you mentioned, would be the phasing out of gestation crates, which are these small metal enclosures in which pregnant sows spend almost their entire lives. They cannot even turn around one time. A number of your competitors have already agreed to phase these out, such as Safeway, Kroger, Costco, and others, and a number of major pork suppliers have stopped doing it or say they're phasing it out, such as Smithfield, Hormel. Does, uh, does Walmart have plans to move toward giving their, their customers a chance to buy more humanely raised pork by phasing out uh, suppliers that produce pork with these gestation crates? I think that's Thanks. a great, I'm sorry, I think that's a great question, and, and this whole animal welfare issue, as you mentioned, is a very critical one. I think there are two answers. You alluded to one at the end, which is just being able to offer your customers choice, whether it be in gestation-free pork or whether it be in hormone-free beef or in a number of other areas. And so that's, you know, that's one commitment that we, we do have to introduce more choice. But you're asking an even bigger question than that. And I think that we are, we're, we're in very uh, deep conversations with the supply chain about how to do that. Um, one of the concerns that I have about some of the actions that others have taken is that they've put such a long uh, deadline on this, 2025 in some of these cases, that I don't really, you know, that it, I don't believe there's an answer yet behind the, uh, uh, the date. Uh, so we're working very hard to find a way to change the economics uh, of, the, of the pork supply chain. And I think that my guess is that if that in a few years, the entire industry, for the most part, will have moved to find an alternative solution. There's a lot of innovation going on, um, and there's a lot of new approaches going on. And you know, I, we don't always love when we're protested and things like that, but I actually believe that this is an area, as long with others, where you know it's important for the voice of the consumer to, uh, to be out there to understand the issues that really matter to the customer because that does get people's attention and I believe that probably all of us are moving faster uh, you know because of the concern that the customer has had and sometimes organized sometimes one at a time uh, and so I think that that kind of noise is a good thing in the system yes sir Bob yep. thank you Bob Nash Bob. hey how you doing what is the difference between the focus and priorities of the Walmart Family Foundation versus the Wal yeah. I guess you call it the Walmart Corporate right. Foundation. Bob, wow, that's a great question. Yeah, and first, you know, we've done a very nice job and we'll keep it of having a very strong firewall between the, our foundation and the Family Foundation for all sorts of reasons uh, that you would want to know. It's simpler for me not to have to explain to the Waltons what I do, and certainly they have no obligation to explain to me what they do, so it works out perfectly. Um, but the uh, uh, we share some interests as a family. Their major contribution and focus has been on education. So as I think many people would know, they really have been a leader in, particularly in the charter school movement. Um, uh, they're, uh, within the family, you have both the chairperson of Teach for America and the chairperson of the KIPP schools, and they've been the largest historic giver to school reform uh, in the country. They've also uh, have done a lot of work uh, in the environment and sustainability, and a lot of work here in Arkansas, particularly in the southern part of the state. Um, so we share a lot of interests, but we don't share uh, sort of programs or staff. Uh, so I always encourage anybody, particularly in the state of Arkansas, who has a good cause to see us both, because the decision making is, uh, uh, is very separate. Yes, Marlene, right here. Hi, I'm Marlene New. I'm from Heifer International, right next door. Um, I know that Walmart's made um, a lot of very public, very ambitious goals of outsourcing from smallholder farmers in your supply chain. A lot of other companies are making those same, um, having those same goals and are meeting some challenges. And I'd, I'd wonder if you would maybe um, t tell us about how you're doing against those goals and what are some of the challenges that you've been facing and how are you looking to overcome that? That's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I think that we, and as you said, other companies have recognized is that there's a tremendous business value in, in, in sourcing from small stakeholder farmers, um, and particularly in the developing world, but also here in the United States, um, because it's, uh, you get fresher, better produce, and frankly, you get it at a better price. Uh, so the, the, uh, the distributors and the middle people in this can be taken out of the system, uh, and, we can re and, and they could be replaced with uh, more income for the farmers and, a, and, a, and, and uh, a different kind of supply chain. 
Um, and so we've pledged, as you said we did, we said we were going to source directly from a million farmers around the world and bring them into our business. And um, I think we, and it is exactly the right business model to use, and it is a heck of a lot of work. Um, and so I think our biggest challenge has been, frankly, in, in, um, in doing that work, because in order to, God bless you, in order to make that happen, and uh, you know, you should be answering this question, you will know it better than I do, there's, you have to put a lot of infrastructure in the middle. Uh, it is very difficult, and this is also true when you buy from uh, uh, small women suppliers around the world, particularly if you're a big company like ours, it is hard to buy uh, f straight from a million small farmers. So you have to work on the infrastructure to, uh, in the middle. The Clinton Foundation has also done a lot of that work in Malawi and elsewhere, to, and the governments need to be engaged. So how do you, how do you build the silos and the aggregators for, so that the, all that produce can come into one place that a big person can come? How do you give those farmers access to market signals so that they know uh, what to plant? How do you, another part of what we're trying to do is to help them be more sustainable farmers. How do you create, in a sense, a agricultural extension service to operate in these countries so that they're learning to be uh, also more sustainable? And, um, and so I think that's really where the work is. It's in building this infrastructure and doing the training and also changing our own systems so that we, we have our own kind of buyer infrastructure that knows how to go deal in the community. I think the biggest you know, issue that we've had in our goals, frankly, has is, is just been a miscalculation on our uh, part a little bit in China, where we thought it would be easier to be able to reach directly into small farmers. Uh, that's just for understandable reasons. We didn't quite put down on a piece of paper, been a little bit harder. Um, but um, you know, we, we're, we'll still meet the goal. And, it, and it's, been a, it, it, it's a great thing to do. Here in the US, Interestingly, you know, we're trying to do the same thing. We've made a pledge to double our sourcing from locally grown produce, which we've, already, we've done much faster. And then, there the issue, though, is can we do that from small farmers as well as large farmers? And a lot of that doubling comes from large, comes from large farms. And so that's been a question people um, have had for us. But whether you're Coca-Cola or Unilever or ourselves, we all should be sourcing from smaller farmers because it's the right thing to do for the customer and the right thing to do for the economy. It's just work and lots of it with a lot of great partners. And I, you know, I'm glad you asked. I'll just say one other thing is all of this work, and we were talking about it before, I think one of the things that's changed since I, my first job out of college was an environmental defense fund and I you know, spent my time trying to get various chemicals banned and there wasn't a lot of love between the business community and the environmental community or vice versa. And I think one of the things that we've all learned over the last several years, uh, partially fed by the fact that we know that government's not going to provide a lot of the solutions that we want, is that really civil society, governments and business have to work together to solve problems. And the pragmatists and the, in all those three communities have recognized that that's true. That was not true before. So you cannot do work on small stakeholder, we cannot do work on small stakeholder farmers without the help of organizations like Opportunity International or Heifer or NGOs like other uh, consulting groups like TechnoServe. And no matter how much work uh, those folks do so remarkably well in training and empowering small women entrepreneurs or small farmers, unless people like us buy this stuff, they don't have a market. So the only way to really address a lot of these issues is to do it together. And I think that's been one of the breakthroughs of the last several years, and that is another trend that just simply has to continue in the future. We, 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 real, we all have to sort of drop some of the ideological or president, you know, kind of concerns we had about each other and realize that the job could only be done together. Got a question in the back right here. That's you, Terry. Thank you. Uh, I'm with the American Red Cross. We are, so I thank Walmart for their generous support uh, of disaster relief and our infrastructure. So I appreciate that. We are utilizing it more than we probably care to. One of the questions I had is, uh, speaking of weather, uh, year before last, a third of the state was under floodwaters. Uh, we're still experiencing extensive droughts in large areas. Uh, and then during the Midwest floods, you saw where you had to have a lot of slaughter of, of uh, hogs, and Texas had to do early uh, slaughter of, of uh, cattle because of the weather. And I just wonder, what do those effects have on your food program? Yeah, well, you know, I think this is, as you said, has been quite a few years for weather uh, and no, uh, uh, 
and, and with those same uncertainties. So clearly we're even, as you said, I'm sure the American, you're facing it, kind of more demand for your services than you might have even planned for. And we're, you know, in a sense, our foundation just is a very small piece of what, you know, small compared to what you all do, trying to deal with the demand. Uh, and also to try and do a lot more emergency preparedness than people would have done before, and a lot more embedding with emergency operations centers to make that all more efficient. So all of us in this, that part of the world are gonna have to do more work to, to sort of get more help with less, in a sense, and also to make, have people be more prepared. Um, the, the issues of, these, of having a safe yearly food supply chain, I think, is a critical one. It's also an opportunity here in the United States. One of the things that we've tr been engaged in is something we call heritage agriculture, uh, which is to say that if you think about it, we have more, um, you know, more Asians in America. They want to drink, they want to eat more uh, bok choy. We all want to live longer, so we all want more blueberries. Uh, we have a larger Hispanic population there, you know, have certain... Um, uh, a desire for certain kinds of fresh produce. And so one of the things that we all need to do is to figure out how to bring some of that farming back to the United States because a lot of it's in overseas, which is all you know important and good. But if you want to have, if you're a retailer and you want to have fresh blueberries all year round and you don't want to have to uh, pay for or bear the environmental costs of having them shipped thousands of miles before they get to the shelf and you want to have even greater security in the uh, pesticide and other environmental controls. You want to start figuring out ways to bring that production back here in the United States. So we're very focused on trying to find parts of the country. We just made a major grant at the University of Arkansas to try and bring strawberry farming kind of back in a more sustainable way. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity back here even in the United States in mostly what's going to be small stakeholder agriculture to bring that agriculture back to the United States and obviously around the world. This, whole issue of how we're going to feed a planet of nine billion uh, is, a huge, uh, is a huge issue, and weather is part of that. The whole debate on GMOs is uh, part of that. Uh, there, those are going to the whole debate on water and land use is part of that. How we have uh, the issues about food security. So this whole issue about the food supply and how it relates to the environment is a huge issue uh, we'll all be facing with for many years to come. It's going to be nothing but a challenge. Yes, sir, we got a question right here. Wait, wait for the mic, please. When you're in your new community in the next two to three years and they're building a Walmart, say, next door to you or close by, what would you tell politicians and community activists on why the Walmart's good for the community? Well, I happen to live in a street in Washington, D.C., where they're, 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 they've completely blocked it off to put a competitor's supermarket down at the end of the street. You can imagine how upset this makes me, because not only am I going to get the traffic and am I getting all that construction, but I'm going to have to pay twice as much for my food. So it's very annoying. The, uh, you know, I think that really, for the most part, communities speak for themselves. And that is if you do a poll of, of the community in which a Walmart's going in, typically 60, 70, 75 percent of people want the Walmart. And for better or for worse, it's because the brand really means something to people. It means that they can go have a one-stop shop and they don't have to worry about getting ripped off and they can get things at a price they can afford. In today's economy, that store plays an important part of people's lives. And I think that's the most important part of this. I spend a lot of time you know, doing focus groups and watching them and going to the stores. And, um, you know, the, and, and many of you either have experienced this in your own lives or see it in your community, but the number of people who are making, who are living paycheck to paycheck or having to make incredibly difficult choices about, and who are also being incredibly smart about how they shop, they're going to three or four different stores, following coupons, and have, you know, doing the math in their own head about how much it costs and gas to go one place to save money versus going to another place. The amount of sort of studious work that people put into shopping in this economy is, is, is and the way that they've adjusted to this new normal is, is a uh, rewarding thing and a sad thing at the same time. So I think the most important thing we can say to people is that people want that, want the Walmart. And I think, frankly, a lot of people are afraid about the, you know, the kind of people a Walmart's going to bring in, and that's a problematic thing as well. I think Walmart as a neighbor is absolutely no different from any other store. Uh, and yet, obviously, there are a lot of folks more concerned about our store you know, than about someone else's. And I can understand if you live in a neighborhood, you don't necessarily want a store on the corner. You don't want the traffic. Uh, you don't want the other issues. But uh, the fact is that I think you know, Walmart provides more 
benefit to the people in the location and uh, with absolutely no increased, you know, kind of risk. Bill, you got a question right there. Your, uh, your buyers are very astute business people and, and negotiators. Um, do they, when you, when you want to develop a, a smallholder, farmer, supply chain, do they, do they negotiate with them differently than your other suppliers or, or how do they, how does that go? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. They do. Um, what we've had to do uh, in a lot of these areas, and we're just learning how to do that, but we're, for example, we made a pledge on, uh, to increase our sourcing of U.S. US business by, uh, uh, from the U.S. of $50 billion, and we have work on veteran sourcing and on women's own sourcing. And one of the things that we learned we weren't doing very well was identifying and supporting and incubating and teaching those businesses how, how to work with Walmart. Not only how to negotiate with us, but how to work at scale, how to, how to grow with us. And so we're just in the process of kind of standing up a much more centralized and experienced unit to help those help identify and bring those businesses and help them prosper with us. And that's something we weren't doing very well. So that's one thing we've, we've had to learn. Um, because we found, to your point, we were also saddling our... So the first thing a buyer is supposed to do is to buy something that the shopper will, will buy at a price the shopper will pay. And now we've shown up at their doorstep and said, that's all well and good. You still have to do that, but we want you to source from women-owned businesses. Uh, we want you to make sure that everybody who works for you meets these high standards of uh, sustainability. Uh, and we have had to work a lot with them to teach them how to do that, to supply them services, to make, it, to make their bosses recognize that, to recognize the successful ones. We've just put a... Uh, uh, for the first time, if you're a buyer, a part of your formal evaluation every year will include something we call live better. So you're going to have a specific uh, a business objective on small sourcing or women's sourcing and sustainability that when you come up for your evaluation, your salary review, you'll be held accountable for. So a lot of business systems, a lot of scorecarding uh, to make it simple for people and a lot of work with them to try and understand how to help those businesses grow through pricing. It's, but it takes a lot of learning on our half. Hi, um, I'm Kathy Searcy, and I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, in my day job, I work with rural Arkansas, so you're making a big difference there. But in my volunteer time, you have made a big difference for Gaines House. It's a historic home here in downtown Little Rock. It's the only place like it in our state. But we are a transitional residence for uh, homeless women who have mental or um, emotional illnesses and they need a place to recover. And so what you've allowed us to do is to give them a solid roof over there and a warm place to stay and programs to help them be restored, to return to their families and to the workplace. So thank you. You've made a difference. That's great. It's great to hear that. Yes, ma'am, we have a question. Right, now get you, Jerry. Right, no, we got one behind you. Oh, we have to give him one, too. He's had his hand up the oh, whole No, time. we're going to get in there. So is she. she. Thank you. Um, I'm a physician, and I'm concerned about the obesity problem that we have, in our, especially in Arkansas. And I'm also sort of peripherally involved in the cooking matters and shopping matters. Um, every time a Walmart opens, obesity sprouts around Walmart. Uh, the obesity rates go up in the neighborhood of the Walmart. And when, when we do go shopping, you know, with, with my patients or with clients, I have to walk through the whole store and tell them just completely avoid these five different aisles in Walmart. So I find that Walmart just sells processed food and junk food. Um, what's, what's your response? To, and on one hand, you're trying to encourage shopping matters and cooking matters. On the other hand, the most profitable things in your store are, is, is processed food and junk food. Um, thanks for the question. Um, the obesity issue, as you said, is incredibly complicated in having, to, in having to solve. I do question some of the facts that you've mentioned. I think that what you see is that, is that what happens in communities, and I think the specific study you mentioned also has questions one could ask, but in a lot of the communities in which we build a store, we, we've made a pledge to build them in 375 food deserts around America, people don't have access to food. And when they have access to food, though, for the first time at an affordable price, they're going to make their own choices. And um, there can be different perspectives on this, but I think that it, um, 
uh, you know, it's our sense that we have to allow our customers to make that choice. It's the same, argue, same conversation people have on uh, Snap and WIC, do on, on Snap dollars particularly. The, there are folks who make a very strong argument that you should not be able to use government Snap dollars to buy things that are unhealthy. Uh, and yet the, the group, the, the constituency groups that, uh, that are, that are over-indexed in EBT and in SNAP disagree with that profoundly. Uh, they don't believe they should be told what they shouldn't eat. Um, and so we've taken a, a different approach, which is to try and uh, reformulate the food we sell to make it healthier. So we made a pledge, which we're well on our way to doing, of taking 25% uh, of the sodium, 10% of the sugar, 100% of the industrially added trans fat out of big categories of food that we sell. We, we're well on our way to being successful about that. We said that we would reduce the uh, cost of, of fruits and vegetables, and we've saved our customers $2.3 billion in fruits and vegetables compared to uh, another store. Uh, and we've invested heavily in uh, creating for the first time a seal called Great For You that when the First Lady and I toured a Walmart in Springfield, Missouri a few weeks ago to see that seal put together with CSPI and a lot of other organizations that we think for the first time is an honest seal to direct people to healthier food. And we're gonna put a lot of support into, into educating people about that. Um, so we think that's our, that's our role. There are folks understandably who say we, all, we, know we shouldn't be selling sugared soda. I mean, these are all completely understandable points of view. Um, I think, it, I think and, and by no means do I ever try and say that we are get things exactly right or you know, meet all of the uh, thoughts that people have, but I think at the end of it we've sort of felt you know, it's our job to try and we have to give people a wide offering, but what we really want to do is provide them healthy food, healthier food at a price they can afford and help them learn how to do that. And actually one interesting thing about the Walmart business model, it's true I think a little bit for maybe you all, is that it really doesn't make a difference to us what we sell. We have to keep the customer happy, which means you know, if the customer comes to a store and doesn't see what they want to buy, they'll go to another store. So just one of the realities of the business is assortment. You have to have what people want to buy or they'll go somewhere else. That's for better or for worse a core reality of, the, of, of supermarkets. Um, and, uh, but actually, we're just as happy to sell fruits and vegetables as we are anything else. The margins in these products are just not different, and that's why you'll see more and more supermarkets, not just us, putting more money into their you know, fresh produce because it's something that people want. So it's a great challenge. It's good for us to continually uh, be challenged about that going forward. Sure. Uh, my name is Jerry Adams. I'm involved with the Community Foundation and the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, and both organizations are looking at corporate social responsibility. We're in a state with predominantly small businesses without the uh, leverage or the scale that Walmart provides. And what would be your learnings as it relates to our communication with these companies who really want to be a good corporate citizen, um, but in some ways have demands different from uh, and separate from a Walmart? No, it's a great question. We have the luxury of scale in many ways, and so we have the luxury of staff. And the we're in the public, you know, domain, so we're called upon to do things that we should do for our reputation. Um, I, you know, I think that it is important to make things simple for people, uh, and it's important, I think, to try and scale the requests and the solutions down to their their scale, um, because I, you know. People want to help, and small businesses want to be part of their community, perhaps more, even more so than, than us. They kind of need help in, aggr in, in, in aggregating their ways they can, they can help and making those entry points simpler, because I think we have to make it efficient for small businesses to participate at the local level. And how do we use technology and other means, uh, and other means to do that? You know, an example on this I've been thinking of lately is we have this made this pledge on women owned on, I'm sorry on veterans we called 43 of the 50 uh, you know biggest people to have this meeting but I've been talking to some of the technology companies because why wouldn't we want to put something online somewhere that would let any small business make a pledge so if a small business wanted to make a pledge for to hire one veteran and you multiplied that across America they'd beat our hundred thousand right away but we don't often th you know think that way uh, we haven't done what I just said yet, but it's on my list. Um, so I think there's also a lot of ways, we've learned this in small donor giving, to find ways to use technology to, to collect from smaller, you know, to, to give opportunities to smaller people to make contributions and find ways to sort of aggregate their help into these larger programs. And I think that 
places a bigger role for the statewide community foundations or others to be that intermediary and doesn't happen by itself, but I think you can unleash a lot of power, even I think in that simple example, I think if you gave people a portal where they could be recognized and tell their story about hiring one veteran, we get a lot of small businesses to make that pledge and you know, there are a lot of other models like that. And I think it's great that you're doing that work. We were talking at lunch with some of the students here who were focused you know, on that work too. So I think that's a great opportunity. I know there's some more questions and we're gonna allow, uh, we're, we're gonna have to cut it off because I know people have got to get back. But Leslie will be here for a little while for anybody that wants to visit individually. Let's give a big round of applause for Leslie Doc. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you all for being here. And I think everyone can see the impact that Leslie has made on Walmart and this state. Uh, and we're glad he's with us.